this past week, I had my best ever performance in a tournament during Title Tuesday. Title Tuesday is an event that takes place weekly on chess.com just for title chess players for a chance to play different title chess players of all levels from all around the world in an 11 round blitz Swiss tournament for a chance to win a combined prize pool of $5,000. I decided to try my shot at it this past week and scored 5 out of 11 points and reached a new blitz peak rating of 2451. In the first round, I faced an international master from Italy. Stay tuned to see how the game went live, followed by an analysis of the endgame. Zora, thank you so much for the 50. Thank you. Oh my gosh. If you guys didn't know, we had the Blitz bounty that I just accomplished yesterday. So I appreciate that, Zora. Thank you for putting that on the line and supporting me. That means a lot. Yeah, I always play the upper half first round. It's, it's usually never fun. <laughs> Thanks so much again, Zora. If you guys got a gift to Seb from Zora, please, please, please thank him. Hey, Esther, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much for the 52. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate the support, guys. Hey, Charmer. How are you? Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. He's playing so fast.
Oh damn, I was too scared to go for the win. <laughs> this is just winning. Damn, time. I want to start this analysis at move 27. Up until that point, honestly, we were playing theory for half of the start of the game, followed by just even moves where no one was really able to take a clear advantage, and we traded off into this knight and bishop endgame. Now, after I played the move king to e3, my opponent decided to play the move king to e7, allowing white to start getting an advantage. Now, the reason why is because, as you might have seen in the game, this bishop has no escape squares. I'm covering all its exit routes. All it can go to is b1. So that allowed me to slowly bring my king over and try to trap the bishop. Now, if I played a move like a3 here, unfortunately, the bishop could just hide out on a2. So I played the move bishop to c4 to make sure that the pawn is guarded, again with the idea that king c1 traps the bishop. He found the only continuation that black has to play in order to save their bishop and only lose a pawn by playing the move b5. So if I take, they take my pawn and the position remains equal. After bishop to b3, the most natural follow-up like in the game was to play a5 with the idea that if I go king c1, they're going to go a4. So I could tell by this point that I was already at least going to win a pawn, so I decided that because I only had a minute and a half left on the clock, though this was worth it and I can go into an endgame where I can just try to hold a draw. Some moves continue in an endgame, not much is happening, just trying to improve my king, because king activity is so important in the endgame, you want your king in the center and being as active as possible. And I want to reroute my knight to a better square. I see that this pawn is a little bit of a target, because it's an isolated pawn as is my b3 pawn. And I also see that black has e6, which is a nice setup pawn, which is also a little bit of a weakness. So black has to be careful to make sure that they're defending e6 and b5 at all times. And they never stray too far away from either pawn, because if not, my knight might be able to swoop in and try to win a pawn. Now here my opponent played the move e5, which in the game, I was a little happy to see because it allowed me to play the move d5 and create a pass pawn. And I thought any leverage in an endgame is worthwhile. I was debating taking on e5, which I think would have also been completely fine. But I was just a little worried with my limited calculation, given my time, that after knight g4, they're hitting both pawns. And I didn't like that both my pawns were stacked. So I decided to play d5. Again, kind of keep it closed, keep it a bit safe. My opponent plays king to d6. And now this was a very crucial move that I believe I played, which was b4. Now, the reasoning why this move is so important is because I want to try to cut off the king as much as possible. I don't want the king to be able to come through at all. So by playing the move b4, I can assure that the king is stuck in this little circle here. Because again, it can't stray too far because I do have a pass pawn. We play some moves in the position, just kind of shuffling pieces back and forth. Slowly trying to improve our knights. And I believe the next critical moment is when they decide to play the move h5. A good rule of thumb to remember when you're working with pawns is that whenever you push a pawn or capture with a pawn, it completely changes the pawn's structure. And the problem with pawns is you can never move it back to where it came from. So you are making a commitment every time you decide to move a pawn. In this position here, before he played the move h5, he did not have to worry about his king side pawns at all because my king could not get in at all. And the h pawn was defending the g pawn properly. However, when he plays the move h5, because he committed the pawn forward, this pawn does not have a protection anymore. Now, given I had 40 seconds left, I was not focused on this at all. I was still just trying to hold a draw and not flag. However, here I have the opportunity to get a bigger advantage than I have in this current position. Given the hint of what I was just talking about related to the fact that this is a weakness, Pause the video here and try to figure out what move you would play in this position to solidify this as a weakness. So the move in this position is g4. Because regardless, whether black decides to trade off pawns, push the pawn, or just leave the pawn there and go for a trade off here, I'm making sure that black isn't able to play the move g4, and therefore this pawn remains an isolated pawn with no backup. And now let's say this trade happens and we look at all of black's pawns, Every single pawn is isolated, far away from each other, and the king and knights have to work overtime to try to hold the pawns. Now the next important step as white is to figure out how are we going to maneuver 
our night around in order to try to capture one of these pawns. Because right now, there are a bunch of weaknesses, but if I can't find a proper sequence to capture one of these pawns, all they're going to remain is just a weakness that I'm not capitalizing on. Finding the proper follow-up is not easy here as whites, but the chances that black messes up is a lot higher, no matter what white really does. For example, let's say black decides to move the king here. They can't go back to c7 because knight e6 immediately picks up a pawn. If they decide to go back to e7, knight e6, attacking the pawn in g5, forcing knight to h7, and now what move can you play to pick up a pawn by force? Knight c7, picking up the pawn on b5. Let's say black decides to play the move knight h7 first, so that of knight e6, the pawn's already guarded, and black's king can remain defending the c7 square. Now we can go through the route of playing knight b7 check and try to come in through the other way to try to hit both of these pawns. Let's say king c7, knight a5, and the king can wander around, but now the king is stuck. It cannot move or you'll lose the e5 pawn, and the problem is now black has to move a knight, and doesn't matter because after knight a7, white's going to pick up yet another pawn. So this is a little bit triangulation with my white knights in order to get my opponent's king and knight where I want them so that no matter where they go, they can't hold on to a pawn. And all I need is one more pawn to secure a winning advantage. So g4 would have been a really nice follow-up there. However, I was panicking because of low time. So I decided to just play it safe. So I played king to e3. And again, my opponent plays h4, and I could still follow through with similar ideas because this pawn is still very weak. However, it even makes my life a little bit easier because he's played h4, because now if this knight is ever not on f6 when my king's on f3, I can slide into the square g4 and take the pawn on g5 or play king f5. So now my opponent's knight has even more limitations because they can't allow my king to get to g4. Now, in the game... It's funny because I, I saw king to g4, but I was panicking because of knight f4. I wasn't sure if I was going to magically lose all my pawns. It was a little bit of an irrational fear. I can easily play king takes g5, knight takes g2, and this position is still totally winning for me. But I was panicking a bit. So I ended up, as you saw in the game, giving a check and then just kind of repeating moves. However, if I wanted to press on for the win back in this position here after they played the move knight to h5, if I'm worried about the move king to g4 because I'm going to lose this pawn on g2, what can I play as white to secure a pawn? The winning move would have been knight to e6 because now I can easily pick up a pawn without fearing losing my g2 pawn. And in this position here, it's getting close to plus four, which means white is definitely winning. And I definitely should have pushed to convert this, but chess is heavily psychological. And given the level of my opponent, given how much time I had left on my clock, I was just a bit too worried to try to push this with 20 seconds left on the clock. And I didn't want to end up throwing this end game after holding it down so well. But I thought this was a really nice learning opportunity when it does come to night end games. You can play a game so perfectly, with no advantage really on either side, but when it comes down to an endgame, even the slightest weakness that you can give your opponents, if you're able to find some way to capitalize on it and play efficiently, it can turn into a winning advantage that you can hopefully be able to convert. So I definitely learned a lot from analyzing this endgame, and I hope you enjoyed this analysis as well. Comment down below if you liked this, make sure to like and subscribe, and stay tuned because I will be analyzing more of my highlight games in this tournament in the future videos. Take care, bye bye.